this Carl uh, uh, Shahukar. He's retired from a leading investment banking company last year. He's currently the trustee of Empowering Mobets Trust and a traditional Zoroastrian and the traditional Zoroastrian Trust. He'll speak about. He'll speak about the topic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on this topic at hand, I cannot but reflect on the Zoroastrian community who throughout centuries have actually lived the peaceful coexistence rather than just talked about it. I give you three examples, time permitting. For the moment, let me take you back in time to 2,500 years ago, to the land of Cyrus the Great, the Persian Empire, which stretched all the way from uh, 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 Western India, uh, east, westwards, further into the Middle East, downwards into Egypt, upwards into Eastern regions of Europe, as well as coming back again in Central Asia. Now, I would assume some of you have already heard about the Persian Empire, because I believe history is a great teacher, and we need to learn from it. Uh, basically, this empire of Cyrus, endured through various dynasties and forms for well over a thousand years. So what is it that made this Persian Empire covering such a multitude of continents, regions, cultures and societies so lasting and formidable? It is well documented in the Old Testament. Here I refer to the Old Testament over here, which again is a part of the Bible, the book sacred to the Jews as well as to the Christians. Over there, Cyrus is the only non-person -pers of a different faith who's been known as the Anointed One. So what is it that made Cyrus to be termed as the Anointed One? And even his successors later on, like Xerxes, Artaxerxes, were all talked about very highly and regarded. Now what happens is that in those times, uh, a conquering army would normally ransack all the towns and villages the subjects would be made slaves and taken away back to their own country, which was not the case when Cyrus invaded Babylon. In fact, he uh, took over Babylon with her without spilling a single drop of blood. But that's a story for another time. So after he conquered Babylon, he freed the Jews from captivity. He not only provided them the freedom to live as free men and go to their own homeland, but also using his own funds rebuilt the, tel uh, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, and that the Jews could continue to go to their own homeland as free people and practice their own religion. This was something which was unheard of in those times, 2,500 years ago. At the end of the 19th century, an object was discovered in Iraq, which actually put this biblical, biblical story as proof of history. And this is known as the Cyrus Cylinder. It's a clay cylinder which is currently housed in the British Museum in London. And that exactly matches with what the story was of Cyrus the Great in the Old Testament. So to this effect, the Cyrus Cylinder is known as the first documented Bill of Human Rights. And a copy of this clay cylinder is also kept in the United Nations headquarters in New York City today. I come to the second example, where almost a millennium later after Cyrus, the last of the great Sasanian kings was Kushru II. So Kushru had a Christian wife called Shirin. Now some of you may have heard of the story of Shirin and Farhad more popularly. It's the same person, the author who wrote this story 500 years after Kushru has also written another story which many more people would have heard of is the Laila and Majnu story. I'm not getting into the story of Laila and Majnu, but what we do know is that in 613 and 614 AD, Khushru's army invaded Damascus and Jerusalem once again. Among the pillage of war was the true cross. Now what is the true cross? The true cross is basically the cross on which Jesus Christ was actually crucified. 
It was around in those times. Historians have many theories as to why a Zoroastrian king would unnecessarily take away the true cross, which is clearly neither he nor his people had any use of. An issue worth noting by various historians, both hostile and favorable to the Persians, is that no one accused Kushru of disrespecting the cross or destroying it. Indeed, all historians have uh, ensured and documented that he kept it with honor and in safety. Kushru's actions were motivated by his Christian wife, Shirin, who was not just a wife of the king, but also a representative of her own community, the Christians, on behalf of the Christians of Persia. Much later, as a peace offering with the Byzantine Empire, the true cross was returned back to Jerusalem, back to the Christians, in a huge majestic procession with all the other Christian relics which Kushru had accumulated over the time. Hence, once again that we see that whilst the true cross was brought to Persia, it was returned back in honor and magnanimity, keeping in mind the concept of live and let live for peaceful coexistence. The third and the final example which I want to give is when the Parsis migrated from Iran to India and they landed at the port of Sanjan, which is in southern Gujarat. It is said that when the Parsis arrived in Sanjan, the region was ruled by a Hindu king, Jadav Rana. Initially, the king mentioned that his kingdom was completely full. And symbolically, what he did was he presented a bowl of milk filled right to the brim, thereby expressing that their land has no further place for other people to come in. Because even if you pour in a little more milk, the milk will overflow. What Nerio Sang Dawal, who was the spiritual leader of this group of Parsis, what he did was he carefully added sugar to the milk without spilling even a drop, showing that the Parsis will mix with the locals to, sweet, to sweeten and enrich his kingdom. The king agreed to give them refuge and asked for Parsis to accept the five conditions. Number one was explain your religion. Number two, Lay down your arms. Number three, speak the local language. That's why the mother tongue of Parsis is now Gujarati. Four, adopt the local dress. Parsis wear saris and like for Dosh over here, this is an offshoot of the Gujarati traditional dress which is there. And have the marriage ceremonies only after sunset. To this day, the Parsis have adhered to these conditions laid down by King Jadavrana well over a thousand years ago, thus fulfilling the promise made and enriched the land of India in all respects. They took up arms only against various invaders and fought side by side, giving blood and life along with their Hindu veteran. In conclusion, history is a fantastic teacher. If we fail to learn from it, we are doomed to repeat it and suffer the same consequences. Today, there are factions within factions, each having different agendas, each with different degrees of traditionalism and liberalism, and each trying to trump the other, losing sight of the fact that we are all Indians, first and last. We need to look for common ground to unite and a force which binds us all in cohesion. Only time, the great leveler, can tell what the future holds for us. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, our next speaker.